So uh, without further ado, I'm going to share my slides. Um, here we go. So the first thing I want to say is that the there is some confusion over what the laws are here in Connecticut. They're fairly straightforward and then they sort of devolve into that conflicting information. So it's really important for you to know what it is that they say, become conversant in them, and it's really just gonna help with your peace of mind. It all starts with a history lesson uh, and it comes down to the, our original code of law, which was handed down to us from Roger Ludlow in 1650. In it, he clearly states that education is the responsibility of the parents first and foremost. Then if you've spent any time here in Connecticut at all, you're somewhat familiar with the story about the Charter Oak. And while that is really interesting, the part that's important to us for homeschooling reasons is that during that time there were lots of factions they were making up their own rules for how they wanted it to be and it was just too conflicting afterwards so they decided that they were going to get rid of everything that happened after 1694 and that really reinstated and solidified Ludlow's code for all of our laws if you were to look up today where this falls, you would find it in section 10, 1, 184, under the duties of parents. And until 1872, all it said was, here what's on the screen in front of you. What's important for you to know is that you shall bring your children up in some lawful and honest employment and instruct them or cause them to be instructed in a list of things that Ludlow thought were important in 1650. Now, until 1872, people sent their kids to private schools or parochial schools, or they schooled them at home. In 1872, there was a push nationwide to have public education, and that's where our first change to the law actually takes place. If you were to look it up today, this is what it would look like. And this part that I've highlighted on your screen, this tells us when people were trying to change things, whether or not they were successful. And so we don't really need to look at that part now. So I've taken it away. This first part is what I've already explained to you, that it's the parents' responsibility to see that their children are educated. And in 1872, you get this first addition to our law. And basically what it says is that public school is a possibility and that you can send your children between the ages of five and 17 or 18. And it becomes important, you'll see that I have bolded here this idea of receiving equivalent instruction. And this two sentences together become an if than statement. Because remember, it's your responsibility to see that your children are educated, whether you do that yourself or allow or ask someone else to do it for you. So your first choice is do you homeschool? Your next choice is if you are not, then you have more choices afforded to you. It wasn't until 2011 that we get this next change to our laws. And basically what it gives is some provisions around those ages. So if your children, if your child is five, you can put off going to school for a year. And if your child is six, you can also put it off for a year. They don't need to start their schooling experience until they are seven, but if this is your choice, then they would be starting kindergarten at seven. That is, if you don't homeschool them, which again, is a possibility, right? It's your choice. On the other end of the spectrum, if your child is 17, you can also, also withdraw them uh, and then they can get, take a job, go to college, find a mentor. There's a lot of uh, space inside here, but they don't have to be in school at this time. So this is it. This is all that it says about the duties of parents regarding education here in Connecticut. It seems very straightforward, and it is. There's a couple of other 
spaces where the law talks about education, but not about the duties for parents. So where do the confusions lie? You'll find them here in the C14 guidelines. And please note that they are guidelines. These are not laws. What happened in the late 1980s is that they tried to make some changes to the Connecticut statutes and those things didn't happen. The people who were responsible for that really wanted to see these changes and so they worked in a group and came up with ways that the school system could tell parents what it was they wanted for parents to do. Now, I have copied this from their website. I have not added or subtracted any words from this, but you will notice that I have made the font a bit bigger in places just so that it's for ease of reading. I'd like to direct your attention to the top of your screen where it says requests from parents to educate their child. Now, again, I cannot say often enough that because the, the law here in Connecticut states that it's your responsibility, you do not need to request anything from the school in order to homeschool your child. Um, it's also of note to say that our current Commissioner of Education in Connecticut has already reiterated that homeschooling is your right and if you withdraw your child there you will get zero pushback. That's the law. Now I'm going to move forward here to show you the next section of their document and to explain that they have seemed to have taken the second sentence of the law and switched it with its importance of the first sentence. That first person, first sentence says that it's your responsibility and that if you don't send your child to, you know, if you don't want to educate your child yourself, you can send them to school. So what they've done is switch them. You'll see here that shall cause children to attend public day school regularly. Um, and that's again, if you are not educating them yourself. You'll also notice that there's language around the word must, that they must show equivalency as described in the statute. And again, that equivalency is comparing what it is that you're doing, not necessarily to public school, but to those requirements that Roger Ludlow set out in 1650. Now, I'm going to fast forward again to show you these parts. And remember that this document is intended for people in the school system to tell them how to interact with families who wish to homeschool. So at the top, you'll notice that it says suggested procedures. These are suggestions that they are giving you from the school. And it is important for you to know that each superintendent makes decisions about how they're going to interact with homeschoolers in their area. So as many different superintendents as there are, you can have that many different policies. But in a basis, they are saying to you that parents must file a document that's called a notice of intent. And I do want to again reiterate that they're telling you you must, but it is a suggestion. But what is a notice of intent? It's a document that you and the superintendent sign, and I'll show you some information that's on every notice of intent uh, in a couple of screens. So in A, it says that you must file this document. B through E on this page are telling you how and when and what the expectations are. But please remember that you do not have to fill out an NOI and many homeschoolers do not. But if you choose to, there are some things that happen along with it. So here in F, you will see that uh, there is an annual portfolio review and that means that you will bring a page of work from each subject that you are teaching to show that you have indeed covered those subjects during the school year. One workbook page, one document that shows your child practiced spelling, one page is all that you are required to do. Your children will not be graded on this nor will you be graded on this. 
Uh, there is no judgment here. Basically, you will be assigned a school official. It's often a teacher, and they just check off that you did the things that you said you were going to. Some people have really great relationships with their school officials, and for other people, it's just a method by which to check off the boxes. So it's hard to know at the outset what kind of relationship you're going to have. Uh, some people, most people do this annually, but there are a few instances of people having great relationships with their school official and they talk to them much more frequently than that. It's also important for me to point out G at this time. So there is this gentle threat that says that your continued refusal to comply with their reasonable request of filling out the notice of intent can lead you to being truant. Now, they cannot, but you, it is because it is your right to homeschool, they cannot deny you that. And so if you are not enrolled in school, you cannot be absent from it. If you are not absent from it, you cannot be considered truant. And if you look here to the right side of your screen, I've added the law on this side that, so that you can reference where that information is for yourself should you need it. So, here we, here we go. So here I have all of the information, well, all of the information that they put on the notice of intent. Schools can add things to this information. Uh, they cannot subtract it. A notice of intent does not need to be called a notice of intent. It might be called uh, something with intention or it might have other uh, combinations of words. But if you are uh, asked to fill out a document that asks that both you and the superintendent sign it, it's very likely that this document is a notice of intent. You'll see there's some other things on this page. Uh, they're asking for your students' information, the number of days you will work, how you will assess them. Uh, they want you to schedule that portfolio review. And then there's a list of subjects here that you are required to teach and then underneath that, there are some recommended ones. Notice that science is there under recommended and other. So you can fill in something that you wish to teach this year. Also, it's important to know that a notice of intent is only good for one year. And because it's optional, you will not be penalized either way if you choose or don't choose to do it. If you fill out one this year and continue to homeschool and decide not to do it, that's fine. If you don't fill one out this year and then want to fill one out next year, again, that is perfectly fine. So this asks the question, should you fill out a notice of intent? And remember I said that many homeschool families don't, but we typically don't spend a lot of time talking about whether or not you have. So in this strange time, what might be good reasons for you to fill one out? I've come up with a list of questions, and if you answer yes to two or more of them, I would suggest that you consider filling out your notice of intent. And if you answer no to two or more of these questions, then I would ask that you consider not filling one out. But really, it's your choice. So make sure you understand what the laws are, what the guidelines are, and figure out which of these spaces will work out for you. Print them out, save a copy to your phone, know what your rights are, uh, be real, become conversant in this because this could help you have conversations within your family, uh, with that nosy lady at the grocery store, or someone at the school. Because remember, they're given this document telling them that you must fill out that piece of paper. Many of them don't know that it's simply a guideline. And here I have on this slide where I got this information from so that you can read it yourself. Again, please feel free to take a picture of it, screenshot it, or again, Molly has copies of these slides and you can get them from her. That was a lot, right? We have just a little bit more for what you will need to do legally. 
if your child is enrolled in school, you will have to withdraw them. Please know that a withdrawal letter is not a notice of intent. So if you do fill out that NOI, you will still need to withdraw your children. So please do this in a formal letter. You can get a template online or I can help you with that. In fact, I have a sample of that on my next slide. But keep it simple. You're just going to include your child's name, the fact that you are withdrawing them from their school. And if your child is attending a private school, then you will be taking them, withdrawing them from that private school as opposed to their public school district. The effective date, and I've heard a lot of people forget to sign them, so I've included that in my list of things. Also, I suggest that you send this certified letter, receipt returned, and I have information on that on the next slide as well. So here is my sample document. Uh, I think it's nice when you include the superintendent's name, but if you have trouble finding that, dear superintendent is perfectly acceptable. Again, you'll be withdrawing your child and many people suggest that you should uh, include a sentence that says that you're going to educate your child in accordance with the general statute. You should sign it and then if you choose to, your partner can also sign this. Um, I like for people to write one letter per child. You can stick those in the same envelope, but I feel that it's a, a nice paper trail. If you have enrolled them separately, withdrawing them separately makes things neater. Also, in the green box, you'll notice that I have told you what forms it will take to get your letter sent certified and receipt return. That's two different forms, and in total, it costs you less than $6. When you get your receipt returned, it will tell you when your letter was delivered and who signed for it. You can just keep that receipt in with your records um, and you'll probably never need it. If your child is not currently enrolled in school, then you don't have to withdraw them from something they're not enrolled in. Uh, I think it is important to say that if you have multiple children and some of them are enrolled in school and others aren't, you do not need to withdraw the children that aren't actually enrolled. You generally enroll your child in kindergarten or whenever you got to the state and that enrollment moves forward in time with them through to graduation. So when you withdraw your child, uh, that stops that process. If you do decide to re-enroll your child at any point, that enrollment will also move with them forward until graduation. I hope that the next step is relaxing and looks a bit like this. Uh, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box and then Molly can read those and interrupt me if you have any questions. If you give me just a moment, I'm going to skip out of here and move on to the next portion of my slides. All right, what is homeschooling? Where do I start? How do I know what to do? And if you've done any research at all, you've probably found that there are so many different kinds and lots of different pieces to consider. It's overwhelming. And I'm going to ask you to put those things aside for just a few moments while we talk about how to get to the place where you can make some decisions. The first step is something that we in the homeschooling community call de-schooling. And it's been summer, so it's quite likely that you've already started this process. It looks quite a bit like this. And what we're asking you to do is remove from the idea of learning the trappings of school. Perhaps when you think about learning, it conjures up images of desks all in a row or freshly bought sharpened pencils. And while those are great ways that we have historically learned, they are not necessary to the act of learning. So over the course of this de-schooling time, you might notice that your child or yourself have patterns to how you behave. Do you have a quiet time in the day where you prefer to read? 
Does that happen in the morning after lunch? Is it an evening activity for you? When you have interests, how do you find out more about them? Do you go to books? Are you asking questions? Are you searching on the internet? Figuring out how you, your children, and everyone in your household seeks out new information will help you figure out how it possibly can work for you. And while you are doing this process, noticing your behaviors and taking out the idea of school from learning, there's another step to do at the same time. And I call this step delving. And it's where you are going to do some self-evaluation on behalf of yourself, but also on behalf of everyone in your household. One of those things is to consider what your learning style is. And it's important for the adults in the house to know what their learning styles are because the way that you learn best is also the way that you tend to teach first. And that's great when your learning style matches up with your child's, but oftentimes they don't. And we can figure out ways around that. We can change and go with new ways to get information to ourselves and the other people in the household. So perhaps you learn best by watching and your child learns best from hearing. And so you add those ways in to your educational day. Another thing to consider is whether your learning is social or solitary. Now, most people are not just one, but both in a variety of places. And while there's some significant overlap to uh, introversion and extroversion, they are not uh, mutually exclusive. So a solitary learner often doesn't like to make mistakes in public. They'll take all of their tools, go off to the side and figure things out and come back with what you hope is a more finished product. Whereas a social learner often processes out loud. They enjoy working alongside someone and really making it a collaborative experience. Now, perhaps you are solitary when it comes to writing poetry and social when it comes to doing math or vice versa. There is no right or wrong way for this to happen. So notice what it is and follow these tendencies. The next thing I'm going to ask you to do is get to know your expectations. And again, this your is intended to be plural because you will have expectations of this experience as will each of your children. So figure out what you think the role of the adult is and what they think it is. Think about what you believe the role of the child is and find out what they think their own role is in the process. You notice that I have linked these things by color. So in school, we often have the one that's at the top, the adult in charge. These I've made red. And simply because there is one grown up and so many children with time management and how that all works, that adult needs to be in charge and the children need to do what they say. There's less room for figuring it out. Now, if we move on to the adult as the motivator, I almost called this the adult as the cheerleader because you still are making the decisions, but you're using your enthusiasm to hopefully bring the children along in that tide, right? And you hope that kids are interested and that they want the next piece as it is coming. Now, the adult as the facilitator notices what the students are interested in and then creates an experience around those interests. And with that, you hope that your children will also think that that's really interesting, but perhaps they would add to the experience and have suggestions about what else you could do in that space and time. 
And lastly, I've put on the adult as a general contractor. And I find that many people move in this direction for their teens. But I would like to say that you can also help your younger children to be a general, to be self-directed in what it is that they want to do. Where you lay out, we have some goals, right? Covering these topics in math. What would you like to cover in science? And then what path are you going to take to get there? The older they are, the more input they're likely to have. So in that case, your student will say, well, I was thinking I could learn about this topic, and so I would like to do this in response. Also think about what your relationship is already like, and how is homeschooling going to change that? Will it change it? Do you want to change it? Both yes and no are fine answers to this question, but think about how that could go. Because a friend of mine, oh, sorry about that. A friend of mine said this very wise thing to me many years ago. Unspoken expectations are agreements between one person and themselves, right? And it makes so much sense when you're thinking about it. If you don't open your expectations up people can't follow them. And then you end up with disappointment, disagreements, and frustration on both sides. So really have these conversations with every person in your household. Your partner might have ideas that you don't share and vice versa. Uh, perhaps your kids have some ideas, some fears that they are worried about. Knowing what they are ahead of time gives you the ability to figure all that stuff out. And this is what brings us to the space where you can start making decisions. Now, with all this evaluation that has been happening, basically this comes to a space where you can have this Venn diagram idea. And while I've made it very simple with only two circles, you might have as many circles as you have family members. But really the principle is that you figure out what works for them and what works for you. And that overlap is where you start. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to go outside of your comfort zone. You will. And the idea is to let this overlap get larger so that what works for them enlarges into what works for you, that they learn from you those different ways of learning. And what works for you will also open up and you'll expand that and this overlapping space can really get larger. But to start, really focus on what is the overlap. It will save you a lot of effort and trouble. In this slide, I've tried to show you that there are a spectra of ways to teach and learn. And on this spectra, we go from adult-led. And we've talked a little bit about what school is like with that one person in charge and very many children, very many students. And so that is the ultimate adult-led experience. At the other end of the spectrum, we have something called unschooling. And while it is very educational, it is very much the opposite of what you might consider learning and school. Uh, basically, this is your ultimate child-led experience. So that if, for example, your child plays a lot of Minecraft, perhaps they are going to be an architect or a city planner. Perhaps they're going to be a novelist and this is a way that they can experience world building in a bite-sized chunk in a tangible way at whatever age they are. Uh, maybe they're gonna be a computer programmer. All of the experiences that we have now build forward as foundations to what it is that we're going to become and allowing children to have say in what those foundations are can be really motivating and also satisfying for everyone involved. I'm gonna go back to the other side here next to school. You'll notice that it says online and distance learning. Now, many of you have probably had some experience with distance learning. Online academies are not so different from that. 
still the adults in the relationship end up being the proctors to online education. You get the safety net of having a teacher who does the grading, who assigns the different tasks, but you will be the person who is on hand to answer questions and help things move along. Next, we have the idea of all-in-one curricula, and you can find different curriculum that have everything. And so you have one product that you purchase. You can also do this by subject. So you can find a math curriculum and a science curriculum and a language arts curriculum. But the idea behind these is that you are the teacher and these all-in-one curricula are your tools. I like to think of them as a cookbook. So let's say, for example, that your child is working on a particular goal, and within that there are 10 lessons. Now, hypothetically, let's say that your child understands them in three. Do they have to do lessons four through 10 if they have a good understanding of this skill that they're learning? No. Perhaps you do lesson 10 to make sure that they can do the hardest parts of this new skill or goal. And then if they get it, move on to the next thing. And then you don't have to do those things in the middle. Or perhaps you find you get all the way to lesson 10 and it's still confusing. You have the option then of going back to lesson one and doing it over or searching out some new method to figure out how it works before you then come back and start with the next set of lessons. Really, this affords you the ability to tailor it to the speed at which you learn. And that can be a really great choice to have. The next thing I'd like to talk about are unit studies. And this is a method that lots of us use where we pick something to study and in picking it, look at it from a variety of lenses. I like to use the experience of perhaps your child is interested in airplanes or jets, and perhaps they have noticed that jets come in a variety of shapes, and then you find out together what those different shapes are good for and why those shapes work for the things that they're doing. Maybe you take a look at what jets looked like 10 years ago and 10 years before that. Uh, maybe you are going back all the way to the Wright brothers or even to Da Vinci and his hypothetical flying machine. It becomes a history lesson. Maybe instead you're moving in the other direction and you are hypothesizing about where airplanes are going and what changes are going to be happening. Perhaps you end up talking about the space race and now you're talking about potentials. You're talking about physics and what the limitations are. What is drag and why is it a thing? Uh, you can also look at it from other points of view. Who were the first women pilots? What was their journey like? There's so many different ways to look at this that you could spend an enormous amount of time. So whether you do a unit study for a day, a week, a month, or even a year, with it, you can learn science and math and history and language arts. You can talk about social justice and anything that you incorporate all within this one topic. Now, along the bottom of this screen, I've also included extracurriculars, museum classes, and experiences. It's really great when they support what it is that you are learning about, but remember, they're extra. They don't have to. So whether or not you're studying about airplanes, you can still go to the New England Air Museum and have a great time and learn a lot. So on this screen, I have put into each of these blocks of color a different kind of uh, curriculum that you could be looking at, what you might be interested in. I would like to point, give your direction to the very centermost one here, the nature-based and hands-on programs. I've listed two. These are really great for people who uh, don't want to spend a lot of time on a screen, for example, or maybe your child has an IEP, you're dyslexic, dyspraxic, maybe you're on the autism spectrum, 
whatever that is, these curricula have spent time thinking about learning broadly across those learning styles. And so they've done some of that pre-work for you. Uh, I've talked a little bit about distance learning and I've talked about unit studies. I'd like to draw your attention to the literature-based bubble here on the lower left-hand side of the screen. I've given you a couple of examples and I do want to say that everything that is listed as an example here is secular in nature and has been used either by me or people that I know well to some level of success. It doesn't mean that the things on the screen will be a good match for you necessarily, but it would be a great place for you to start looking and get some opinions that will help you narrow down what your choices are. So you'll also notice that some of these things are on here more than once. Uh, in literature based, I have five in a row and you'll see it also in unit studies on the other side of your screen. Basically how five in a row works uh, I used this when my children were small, but you can be older and still use these principles where you read a story and then you talk about it. And then you read it again. And this time you talk about whether the pictures in the story have more information than just the words gave you. Maybe you'll talk about who's the narrator. Is it someone from within the story or from outside it? That uh, you read it five times in a row, uh, not all in the same day, but you know, consecutively. And it gives you tools to think about the story, story development, critical thinking, uh, and it can be a really great way to interact with the world. And again, like the unit studies, it can be a great way to think about science and math and a lot of different pieces all come together for this. Which brings me to the last step. I would like to say that August traditionally has been my hardest month every year. And that's because decision fatigue is a real thing. There are so many decisions to be made. But the nice part is that once you have decided what your schedule is, how, where you are going, how you're going to manage all the details, then you get to open the present that you have made for yourself. And doing can be filled with newness and excitement. But remember, it's really a cookbook. Your experience doesn't have to look like anyone else's experience that's allowed. I like to think of it as a pot of chili because everybody makes a different pot of chili, right? I rarely make the same pot of chili in my kitchen but maybe you put corn in your chili, or maybe you don't. Maybe yours is vegetarian. The point is, is that it's still chili. So have fun, make it memorable, be different because each one of your families is different. So again, I'd like to say, if you have any comments or questions, please put them in the chat box. I'm going to toggle this to my next set of uh, slides here and talk to you about what homeschooling is really like. The most numerous question I get is how much time does homeschooling take? And this is perhaps an even more prevalent question this year because the world is kind of crazy, right? And a lot of people are working from home. So if school is six and a half hours long, what do they do all day and how much of it is actually devoted to learning? The answer is that when you take out the business of classrooms, handing out 20 sets of anything, sharpening pencils, bathroom breaks, all of that takes up a lot of time and the amount of learning is really low. So on this slide, I've incorporated two different data sets and I have put them on the same slide because I think that they say important things. But please know that they were not designed to play perfectly together. The math breaks down a little bit. But here in the center of your screen, you'll see that this black column, it tells you how many minutes of learning there is in a day for different age ranges. It's important for me to tell you that for the high school age, it says up to 
four and a half hours. And remember, this is time spent learning, not necessarily time spent in school. So this four and a half hours is inclusive of any amount of homework that they might be doing. So if your high school student is going to school six and a half hours and then they have two hours of homework, that eight and a half hours is what we're comparing to the four and a half hours. Please also notice that for middle and high school, it's up to an amount of time. Your child might take more time or less time on any given day. This is why I suggest that you make goals and then you can meet them and have little mini celebrations for each one. So on some days you might find that you'll do one hour of learning while on others you might do three hours. It's okay for it to be different every day. Uh, for those older grades, you might find that you're doing language things on Mondays and Wednesdays, and then you're doing math things on Tuesdays and Fridays. It's okay for it to be different. Now, in the next column, in the gray here, you'll see that it gives you some chunks of time. And basically, this is the amount of time a discrete piece of learning should take. More than this can just be overwhelming and too much. Kids typically shut down and grownups do too. Uh, so let's say you and your kindergartner are hanging out in the kitchen while you're making lunch or dinner and you have magnet letters on your refrigerator and they are busily counting those things and they tell you that there are six yellow ones and that there are three green ones. Well, you can count them and double check and search and find and confirm that that is indeed the case. And then perhaps you help them to line those up so that the yellow ones make a long line, the green ones make a shorter one. What you've done is made a graph and compared these things visually. That's a really important skill to have, and it doesn't need to take you more than three to five minutes. Perhaps they then take it beyond that and they compare other things in that way. And that becomes a self-motivating piece. But the lesson that was taught is just three to five minutes. I think it's also important to say that uh, there's a lot of data out there about attentiveness and learning. And for adults, if you watch a video for six minutes, you're in the minority. By the time six minutes comes along, 90% of adults will have closed down a video. And so by this time, I have been talking to you for about 40 minutes, uh, and I hope that you are engaged and interested. And part of that is because I have been giving you different pieces. So when you have your uh, older learners who are going to be accepting information in chunks that are in excess of that five or six minutes, let it move and breathe. Let there be an arc to what it is that you're saying. It doesn't have to be the same thing for 20 minutes at a time. Um, so if learning takes so little time, what do you do with the rest of your day? And so I have put together some slides of what our life has looked like with some tips about some lessons I learned along the way. Because reading, writing, and arithmetic are really just a small part of your homeschooling experience. This is my daughter. Uh, she was about 14 at the time. Uh, and she loved this t-shirt. She liked to say that not only was she 98.7% chimp, but so are you. This is my younger daughter, uh, and she's looking through this microscope that I got at a tag sale, right? Um, we cleaned it up. It's from uh, 19, it's like from 1910, so it needed a bunch of work, but it was interesting to clean it and take it apart and put it back together. And I just left it 
out for them to use. So they compared what everybody's hair looked like. We found out about split ends. They compared our hair to the dog's hair. And they just learned to use it by using it. And I'm not saying that you have to have a microscope or even use it the same way that we did, but having a tool to answer curiosity just for the sake of curiosity really does help build interest in the world. And also when it came time for us to use a microscope in earnest, they already had some ideas about how it worked and then we could concentrate on the actual lesson instead of having to learn how to use it and the information simultaneously. So your tool of looking closer at something could be entirely different than mine. So it's a pandemic, right? And we might not be going out into the world as much as we had been in the past. Uh, one of my favorite homeschooling bumper stickers is actually home school. We're never at home and it's nothing like schooling. Uh, that's going to be different for everyone across the board this year. We're going to be out less, but some museums can allow you to make an appointment with them and then you can sign up for a docent tour. This one in particular is at the Yale Art Museum where you get a free tour from a master's or PhD student. And not only do they tell you about the art and the artist, but also the time period in which it was created. And that can be really informative to your history or any other aspect of your learning. So I don't know with a period at the end of it, is really a killer of momentum. So here we are studying weather again. It happened to be winter and it happened to have snowed. So they came up with this idea to find out how much water was in snow. So they took my pot and they packed it full of snow, like brown sugar packed that down in there. And then I was really surprised that they watched it melt. They stood there the whole time and watched it because they were fulfilling a question that they had asked. So when a question comes up, give it due notice. Write it down so that you can search the answer later or stop what you're doing and figure it out now. I don't know, let's find out makes you a member of their team that you can do these things together and honestly it is so empowering here we are at yet another museum um, and while i hope that you have a lot of these experiences i wanted to take this time to tell you that your lived experiences are valuable and everyone has slightly different lived experiences have conversations talk to their grandparents and aunts and uncles and friends of yours everyone has different lived experiences and there's something to learn from them we happened to start a program with our local senior center where the kids their parents and these seniors all got together once a week during the school year for five years and we learned an enormous amount of things. Not only did we talk about big points in history, like where they were when JFK was shot or how the Challenger explosion affected them, but we also found out the tiny pieces of living that we probably wouldn't have learned about in a book. For example, we learned that in the 1960s, they had practice time in classes on how to use a fountain pen because it wasn't yet legal to use a ballpoint pen to sign legal documents. And that kind of interesting thing happens just spontaneously. So whatever you learn could be just as fascinating. Here we are in yet another art museum and this is my plug for you to ask open-ended questions. 
for some of us, it takes a little bit more effort to have that practice, but it really does become a valuable part of your homeschooling life. So here's my younger daughter. She's about seven in this picture. And we were uh, looking at a piece of sculpture. I had asked her a question. I don't remember what it was, but she talked to me for almost 10 minutes about what the sculpture was and who was the person in it. What happened in the moment before this moment, frozen time, and what happened afterward? It's made me view. Hi, everybody. I'm having. Red. Is everybody having trouble? I'm having a little trouble at the moment. Um, Looks like I've got some instability. Are you doing okay, Linda? Um, I'm just talking, so I wouldn't notice. Right, right. Is any, is, um, okay, I'm going to shut up. It looks like you're, you're back again. Um, just let me know if anyone else is having trouble. Okay. <laughs> Sorry I, I did. Continue. No, that's okay. So just to reiterate, in case anyone missed it, open-ended questions are your friends. They're great for getting to know people, but also it helps with critical thinking. And that helps them to express themselves better verbally and also in writing. So everybody's good at something, and there are things that you are less good at. When you find people who are good at things that you're not, it opens up the possibilities in your life. I come from a science background, so doing dissections was in my wheelhouse. With families who didn't have biology so deeply ingrained in their background, and it was great to share it. You know, and it also meant that when we had needs and deficits in what our experiences were, we had people that we could go to to help us fulfill those things. You'll also notice that uh, we're doing this in the warm weather, right? We're wearing summer clothes and you can see my weed infested garden behind the girls. Um, that's because I did these things in the summer. A lot of people have an idea that schooling happens during the school year, but when you are homeschooling, you have more time available to you. And so we were what I call 360 fibers. That meant that we spread learning out the entire year. And it also afforded me the possibilities of doing this gross, smelly thing outside where I could hose off the table and the girls, if needed be, with whatever mess there was. And it also meant that we weren't doing dissections on my dining room table in, thank in November right before Thanksgiving. So it doesn't, you don't have to stick to some idea of when stuff needs. Not only do you know other families who will help And at SCAS Lab in Yale. And we had the opportunity to dance with those little yellow robots you see on the table. We also played tic tac toe with a cheating robot, and it made for a great day. Now, you might not be able to go to SCAS Lab this year, but it's quite possible that you know some pretty cool people who could bring cool stuff to your driveway people like to be helpful and oftentimes they'll say yes to a request like this please utilize those things it makes everything a lot more interesting and fun and it gives you something to look forward to right um this is my plug for libraries and librarians uh, so the library is a building filled with media, right? There's so many books, there's movies and audio, there's this magical thing called interlibrary loan where even if your library doesn't have what you're looking for, some other library in Connecticut probably does and they'll get it for you. But the librarian is really your best friend when learning comes to it because their job is 
research and making connections and they want to help you with those things. So if you let them know, for example, that you're studying Poe, they can probably find you a variety of things at different age ranges, right? They'll help you find what's appropriate for you. And they often are thinking about an entirely different way that you are. Again, librarians are your best and often least used resources. So I often get asked, did we homeschool in our pajamas? The answer is yes. Um, we did science in our pajamas. We did, we read classic literature in our pajamas. Pretty much if you could, we did. Which isn't to say that it has to be that way in your house. I know several people who feel that you get, you get information best. You are more professional and more ready to take in information where you are dressed the part. And that is a completely valid point. It's not how it works in my house. Um, you'll also see that I, we did fall prey to the starting one project. That's an art project underneath her. And then um, I think she's reading Pride and Prejudice and Zombie in this picture. Um, another perk is that when people go to work and to school, it empties out the world. Here we are at the movie theater. We are seeing Black Panther at the very first showing. It happened to be at 1.30 or 1.45 in the afternoon and no one else was there. And this was, you know, a giant deal because everybody was going to go see it and we saw it first in an empty theater with all of that sound. It was great. Uh, and again, the world is kind of different now, but there will be pieces like this available to you out in the world. Learning about a new to you culture and making new to you food brings things off the page and out from the screen. The ability to taste and smell and really experience different textures can be really informative and it helps add depth to whatever it is that you're doing. So experiments, um, this we happen to be on vacation and cooking a local specialty and then eating it, you know, be. And lastly, I want to say that it's okay to get distracted by stuff. Um, my kids have loved jumping in puddles since they were tiny and their boots came up over their knees because they were so short. This picture was taken when they were 13 and 15. They never outgrew jumping in puddles. I'll tell you that they're 20 and almost 18 this summer and we put on our bathing suits and jumped in the puddles this summer too. The puddles go away and the mass stays there. This is a great way to bond, to blow off some steam and to just enjoy life as it happens. And taking the time often makes the other stuff go easier. So um, homeschooling is about living your best life and you get to decide what that looks like. On this particular afternoon in March, it looked like two little girls in purple dresses picturesquely covered in mud on the edges of Lake Champlain. And it never looked like this again, right? But each day was a wonderful thing. I never was upset or sad. It was gratifying to be homeschooling for as long as we did. And this is what I hope it will be like for you. Now, I can talk to you about a bunch of other things. I would love to have some guidance from you about what you'd like to hear about. Um, but while you're typing in any questions or comments you have, I would like to tell you a little bit about 
finding some other people who are homeschooling and what resources are afforded to you on Facebook, because that is a space of social media space that many homeschoolers in Connecticut go to, uh, to find connection, to talk about resources, um, and just to have something at your fingertips. And the two I want to tell you about most are um, the CT Inclusives, which has been around for about 15 years. It's a statewide organization and it's filled with a lot of veterans, myself included. Um, and then the next one I want to tell you about is CT Homeschool Alliance. Now, this is a new one and they're a really great organization. I know a lot of the people who are starting it and their goal is to help you see outside of your box, right? Um, just a couple of weeks ago, there was uh, a post that was made about learning about Native Americans and this support space where they told you about a curricula that was written by Native Americans. And when we're learning about points in history or culture, it's great to go to an original source. Another thing that they're really great at is you tell them what you're using and they'll point out to you where the holes in that are. And then often will help you find things that will fill in those blank spaces for you. Because history, for example, is curated. We only have so much time in which to talk about it. And there's so much to choose from. The people at CHA are really devoted to helping you curate better. Because again, we only know from our own lived experiences. Beyond that, these statewide organizations, I would suggest that you find one more local to you and that you put up a post there that says the parameters that you are looking for, who you are, um, maybe some interests that your children have, how you want to move forward. But when you do meet other homeschoolers, those questions about expectation that you had, sit with those and add to them your expectations of how things are going to be during our pandemic. So if, for example, you have someone at home that you're being really careful about, you're going to want to be hanging out with people who, are, who have the same level of safety in mind as you do. So if you're out in the world a lot, you won't necessarily match up with someone who is being very strict and very careful. Knowing those things in advance will help you to make connections that you can feel good about. And I strongly suggest having those conversations sooner rather than later. Okay, I have I don't have any um, questions, but uh, the the remaining folks, you're welcome to to verbally ask if you ha have any, or um, or not. I also once again I do have image the slide images, especially early on in the beginning with some of the legal information. If you would like that. You can uh, write to me if you would like that or say that you would like that in the chat. Um, uh, one of you, if one of you is Heather, I apologize for not sending you the link. And like I said, I do have a recording of this and I can send it to you. Also, uh, Linda, I know you're doing this um, other places at other times. If I could get some of that information and I could share it with people who have missed part of this, that would be wonderful. Um, if you're able to do that, the, um, oh, mine's unstable, maybe I'm. Absolutely, absolutely, I can do that. Okay, That's, that, was, that, was, that, that was wonderful. I wanna thank you very much. And I'm gonna give you guys a last chance you're to ask a question. Yeah, I'm gonna sneak through here and say that if you do have some more questions. This is my business card and you can find me on Facebook. Um, and also you could email me. I offer one-on-one -on -one consulting, group consulting, um, and I'm looking for people who would like to talk monthly or um, twice a month just to share resources and to compare notes, a sort of, you know, support group for the families involved. I'm going to check the chat window here for just a second. 
Um, yes, you are very welcome. And then I'll come back here in case anybody wanted to say anything. All right. That was terrific. I'm glad that this was, I'm glad. Yeah, you did an incredible job. Have a great day. I know you have a lot to do, but. Um, I, you're you. welcome. And, um, have a good day. And I didn't mean to step on your toes for the very end. And I will also keep that information for people who want that. So I'm sorry about that. Okay. That's totally okay. It's hard to manage this on, you know, Zoom without those cues. It's all right. good. No, I know some meetings people are talking over each other and others people really want to keep their privacy. So um, once again, I um, think, thought you were just terrific. Thanks for being so professional. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Okay, bye now. Bye.